Uh, very excited about this panel on competency-based education. Uh, I'm not going to do a big introduction because they're going to introduce themselves. And we also have the great uh, Paul Fain from Inside Higher Ed to moderate. So uh, please welcome this great panel. And Paul, take it away. Hello, all. Can, can you hear me? Great. Um, so I'm Paul Fain. I'm the news editor with Inside Higher Ed. We have a great panel here uh, to discuss competency-based education. Um, just briefly to, to describe our interest in this topic, um, Inside Higher Ed, and, and particularly me, um, I, I've been writing about uh, competency-based ed a lot the last few years, and for three real main reasons. Um, tremendous interest among colleges to create new competency-based programs. The last I heard, somewhere in the neighborhood of six to 700 institutions are in the process of trying to create a competency-based program. Um, you have pioneers in the space like Thomas Edison, uh, Western Governors, been doing this a long time. Some upstarts making a lot of noise, College for America from Southern New Hampshire, uh, where Kate used to work, uh, Capella University, community colleges, and then in recent years, um, the University of Texas system, University of Michigan, Purdue, so a, a real wide range of interest among higher ed, and that of course piques our interest. Um, one of the reasons it seems to us that this is having a moment is the belief that competency-based education, when done well, can better connect to jobs, can, can uh, help employers have more confidence about what students are bringing to, to the workforce. And in a lot of cases, we hear employers actually work with some of these programs to help set the curriculum and to, uh, to work on the competencies that go into these programs. And then finally, you know, I think perhaps most importantly, Competency-based education raises really fundamental questions about higher education. Uh, the, the question about the credit hour and, and seat-based uh, learning versus time, you know, you can see that if this continues to progress, it, it might really change all of higher education, um, which is, I think, one of the most exciting pieces for us because higher education changes fairly slowly. Um, but that's, that seems to have changed since the, the uh, recession to some degree. So enough from me. I'm going to just briefly introduce the panelists, and they're going to tell us a little bit about their work in the field. Um, to my left is Kate Kazin, the managing partner with Volto Learning Group, formerly with College uh, for America at Southern New Hampshire. Um, to her left is Stephen Phillips, the assistant director for the Center for the Assessment of Learning at Thomas Edison State University. And finally, uh, last but not least, Mary Ellen Wiltrout uh, with MIT. She's a digital learning scientist for MIT X in biology. So I think Kate's going to kick it off. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I always am aware that there's a certain irony involved in giving lectures about competency-based learning. I just feel it. Um, and in fact, the name competency-based learning um, has caused no, no end of trouble, as we heard a little bit yesterday. So I'm thinking that if we do this again, we should call it something like Betty. Uh, you know, a little less baggage, you know, a little more intriguing. Uh, but competency-based education it is. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think competency-based education includes while recognizing that, um, you know, thousand flowers blooming and, and all like that is actually a really good thing. Nonetheless, I think uh, because of the phenomenon that Paul mentioned, namely the sort of, I, I hesitate to call it a fad, but certainly a mushrooming of interest in CBE, uh, some things are being called CBE um, that, to my mind, probably are better characterized other ways. Um, it's sort of like how, do you remember when, um, you know, everything started being natural, you know, and now we have new, healthier cane sugar, you know, so I, I think it's a similar phenomenon. Anyway, so to my mind, there are three elements of competency-based education that make it distinct. And I'll talk a little bit more about what each of these is, um, but my perspective is first that the flexibility of time um, is critical, um, and the assessment aspect is critical, and the doing, and that's probably the part that I think gets the least amount of attention and is, to my mind, the most important. So this was my attempt to do a Venn diagram that came out more like, you know, the Olympic rings uh, on a bad day, but nonetheless, um, I think you can see how these circles overlap so that 
if you have a sort of flexibly paced or open, uh, self-paced um, kind of learning experience and there's assessment, right, you get credit by exam, basically, right? If you have sort of a flexible pace and something that is focused on the doing uh, rather than what's sometimes called simply knowing, which is kind of funny, um, and then you get maybe something like self-enrichment or um, a continuing ed kind of class that doesn't have an assessment. Um, and if you get the doing focus and assessment, you get performance assessment, right? So you can imagine something like a phlebotomy assessment, which could be time bound, but nonetheless is focusing on performance. And then when you get all three of them, you get the gold star, namely CBE. So um, my beautiful graphic is not showing right now, but um, I think we have the wrong slides, but it's okay. I want you to imagine the dolly clock, which is pretty famous, which you know is kind of an awesome counterpart point to, the, to this quote uh, from the former president of uh, Phoenix and um, actually a continuing um, board member at Lumina. And various people have made some version of this crack, you know, namely, you know, if you're measuring C time rather than learning, you're focusing on the wrong end of the student. Um, and I think it still holds, holds true. And assessment, obviously, we all know it when we see it. Um, but it's worth remembering some of the different types of assessment. Um, you know, when I took my test to get my learner's permit, um, I would say I could tell you how far down the alley you were allowed to park, <laughs> um, but um, I couldn't tell you very much about what it was like to drive because I really had no clue. Um, when I took my driver's test, I still had no idea how to drive, but at least I was licensed to be dangerous. <laughs> and um, I think this illustrates pretty well what we mean by performance assessment. Now this is the part I want to zero in on for a moment. Um, you probably can't read this, can you? So we can have a little contest about what it says, which could be amusing but time consuming. So instead I want you to imagine a, um, a stereotypical hiring situation and the, the old white guy is the hiring manager and the people are clustered around him and the hiring manager is saying, let's hire this candidate why she has a B plus in introduction to sociology. Okay, a little bit of chuckle, maybe, I don't know, but okay. <laughs> but why is this so ludicrous? Well, it's ludicrous for a couple of reasons, right? But one of them is the grade you get in a course tells you absolutely nothing about what skills you might have that are transferable, right? And introduction to sociology probably tells you that this person did pretty well in that course, at least compared to other people in that course, right? But it doesn't convey anything about can she do research, can she interview people, and so forth. So I think this is where the doing actually becomes so critical, and as Paul mentioned, this is part of why there is such interest in the employment um, informing capacities of CBE, even though many people then say, oh, wait, it's just for vocational education, right? As though education to help people get jobs was, you know, just. But, um, but nonetheless, I think the focus on doing, in other words, rather than simply knowing, is the thing that I think gives CBE its power. So I've been using the word competency rather freely. And um, again, here's a slide you can't possibly read. Um, and I just want to suggest what we at College for America, a, a competency-based college that uh, was, is part of Southern New Hampshire University that Chris, Chris Clerken and I um, helped found uh, five years ago. And by the way, Paul, only in the world of higher education uh, can you have done something five years ago and be an upstart. <laughs> it's true. But I think there are three things about these competency statements, and we have a real honest goodness CFA student here, which is exciting beyond belief. Um, so one of them is that 
it doesn't say how long or how you get the information, you get the competency, right? That's the time flexible idea, right? And you get a little confused sometimes when we start to say, think of CBE as only in uh, an academic environment because then you do care about um, the environment in which people developed competencies, right? But if you think about competencies as statements that stand apart from how someone developed them, right, you begin to see their power, right, crossing from an academic or learning environment into an employment situation. They are at their best measurable, right, duh, that's pretty basic assessment, but also observable. So sometimes I see competencies that say, student understands such and such. And I think, well, okay, <laughs> you know, your guess is as good as mine, right? What, what does that mean? How do you know, right? Um, and again, that goes to good assessment principles, but it also goes to the doing I talked about, the actually using competencies to do something. At College for America, we express competency statements as can-do statements, uh, which I will admit I ripped off from ACTFIL, which is the um, does language assessment, and they express all of their uh, proficiency statements as can-do statements. And um, I liked both it suggested that students could do something, right? It's got a kind of optimistic quality. Um, but again, it puts the focus not only on the can part, but also on the do part. And um, if you could read this, what you would notice <laughs> is that it includes things like can negotiate with others to resolve conflicts and settle disputes, as well as more kind of conventionally academic things like can convey information by creating charts and graphs. And one of the things I'll, I'll talk about at the end is, which will come soon, um, is why this kind of fear that somehow what are sometimes called 21st century skills or soft skills, which really seems diminutive, um, is um, that they're somehow not measurable or um, that they're like some, you know, uh, I don't know, deep web that can't be accessed. Um, and um, I think competency-based education gives you a way to think about how to assess uh, the full panoply of competencies. So because I, my perspective on competency-based education, and it's called com Perspectives on Competency-Based Education, so I thought it was okay to have one, is that if you want to know what people can do and how they can use what they know to accomplish something, it's really helpful to ask them to do something. So at CFA, we designed the academic model around projects, um, which are, I would say, kind of the poor man's simulation. They're scenario-based, um, a lot of information to uh, integrate, an actual real thing to do. Um, and they're evaluated by experts, uh, sometimes practitioners and or faculty, um, using rubrics, but the part that goes back to time flexible, that first component I mentioned, is that there are multiple opportunities, in fact, infinite opportunities, to get feedback, to submit, revise, resubmit, and so on. So it really does take time pretty much entirely out of the equation, right? And I sometimes hear people say, but, but isn't time really important? I mean, after all, if somebody takes five years to write one memo and somebody else can do it in five minutes, isn't that a good thing to know about an employee or a candidate? To which I would say, if being able to do it relatively quickly is actually what you're trying to assess, then of course time is legitimately part of um, the assessment, right? But if it's irrelevant, then it should be irrelevant, right? So, you know, it used to break my heart when I was a regular old English professor, um, and at the end of the year, or the semester, I would hand back students um, papers in which I had written, you know, great, great tomes of um, feedback, and of course they never picked them up, right? They wanted to know what their grade was. And 
it was the end of the learning experience as opposed to the continuation of it, which I thought was kind of sad. And some examples of projects are things that you might see in, you know, a, let's say a business class, like creating a marketing plan, or let's say designing a website, but um, we also have things like curating a virtual art exhibit. And you can imagine that type of project as opposed to the kind of exams I did when I was in college in which there would be a picture of a famous painting and I identified it, right? I mean, I mean, it really kind of activates students' learning in order to imagine themselves helping someone else look at art or think about art. So one of the reasons why I'm so jazzed about competency-based education and about project-based learning in particular is that, as I mentioned, it's such a wonderful way to assess the kinds of skills that employers care desperately about and that they're not getting from most graduates. Right? Even really good graduates from really good colleges will often come into the workplace without what the employers regard as really critical skills. It could be writing and problem solving. You know, it could be knowing how to talk to someone who has a different role or place in the hierarchy than you do. Um, and every single year, AACNU does these surveys of employers, and every single year, the employers say, these are the things we really want, and here's what's not happening, right? It's this persistent gap we, we talked about yesterday, and I think is really contributing to this generalized uh, dissatisfaction with higher ed, fair or not fair. I would suggest that it comes about in part because our colleges and universities are set up around disciplines, right? Um, so if you're a history professor, right, you may want your students to write well or want to try to help them, right? But your main job is the history content, right? And people say, oh, wait, wait, but we have interdisciplinary courses. It seems to me it doesn't get at the real issue, which is um, how can we surface the kinds of competencies that every single college says on its website are critical, right? But that are somehow invisible in the general approach to um, teaching and learning. Again, I think that doing, you know, I keep talking about it as though it were a, sort of a Zen quality or something, but um, I, I think when I read competencies that are really about, they're basically student learning outcomes in which the student is being asked to um, either regurgitate, to put it unkindly, or to reflect back, or, uh, uh, or spit back, or even just um, put in a test of some sort, um, something that really doesn't help them know, right? Think about our poor sociology applicant, right? Um, they don't know what skills they have, and they do have skills, right? So um, I think this is why project-centered CBE um, has such promise, and if we want to call it Betty from now on, we can do that, but it'll be just among us, so thank you. Thanks. Steve, you want to follow up? Good morning, everyone. I'll try to get through these slides pretty quickly so we can get to those questions. Um, I'm just going to give you guys uh, Thomas Edison's perspective on competency-based education. Um, there we go. All right. Uh, so yeah, so that's, that's me. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Sometimes I say insightful things. Uh, Thomas Edison State University. We were founded in 1972 part of that college completion movement, um, trying to get folks to earn degrees. Uh, our average student age is 37. Um, we do a lot of prior learning assessment, um, and we have a really good persistence rate with students that go through, as, as Mark mentioned earlier. Um, we're competency-based education network members, and we've been working on CBE for um, a, a long while, which I'll get into. Um, yeah, we can skip through this one. All right, so, uh, Thomas Edison was founded as a competency-based education institution. Um, if you look back in our college catalog from 1972, it actually says competency-based education. Um, but the, 
that term has, has changed over the years. Um, and, and so has our institution. Uh, we earned a, a couple of FIPSI grants and some, got some money from the uh, New Jersey State Legislature that allowed us to build the first online courses in the, 19, in the 1980s. Um, and since then, we've really focused more on online courses than we have on the competency-based education that, that made us great. Um, but you know, we've, we've found over the last couple of years that there has been a need to return to our roots and return to competency-based education. Um, with the, the sequestration um, and the freezing of the tuition assistance for military, we lost a lot of students that, that just never came back. Um, we saw more and more institutions moving into that online market, um, so the University of Phoenix among others. Um, Kale's Learning Counts has sort of replicated to a certain extent and expanded what we do with prior learning assessment. And new direct assessment schools like College for America um, are coming in and doing essentially what we do with prior learning assessment, but better and more effectively. Um, not only that, as, as Kate mentioned, students and employers struggle to understand what they learned in a course. You know, if you get a B plus in accounting, what does that actually mean? Um, and you know, we need our students and the employers to understand uh, what, what that means. Um, and not only that, students were coming in um, to do prior learning assessments and maybe they didn't have three credits of knowledge, maybe they only knew the practice, you know, maybe they were a, market, or a manager for 20 years, um, but they didn't know management theories. We couldn't give them credit in our current system. So what we decided to do was to take a look at um, an individual degree program, um, in this case the uh, Associates of Arts and Liberal Studies, because we wanted to tackle our general education. Um, one of the main criticisms of competency-based education in its, its new formation is that it's really vocational training, it's workforce training. It doesn't have those soft skills or those power skills as, as Kate mentioned. So we wanted to just prove that it could be done. So we took a look at you know, what, what are the degree requirements, what are the general education requirements, um, and then we took a look at what are the courses that satisfy them. Um, so in this case, I don't know if you guys can see, but for ethical leadership is one of our, our requirements that all students have to take at least three credits of, of ethics. Um, and there's a half a dozen courses that satisfy that. So what are the overarching themes and ideas in each of those courses? Um, what are we asking students to do across that curriculum? And can we design statements um, around, around that? We also took a look at the DQP and the AAC and U value rubrics to help feed in and give us uh, kind of a more global uh, picture of what, what degree qualifications looked like. Um, and then we designed the, our competency statements. Um, so it's broken down for this degree into, uh, this is only a, a screenshot of the top, but it's, it's three groups, uh, 16 domains, and uh, 57 statements. Um, they're each equated to some sort of uh, credit hour equivalency, but they're not all the same depending on the size of the competency. Um, and we've, at this point, worked with uh, the Sailor Academy to design a curriculum around each one of those competency statements. Uh, and we're, we're working on the assessments ourselves. Um, so this is, this is the model we came up with. Every student that enrolls at, in our CBE program uh, will be given a list of all of those competency statements, the assessments that we're planning to, to have them go through, and then the rubrics that we're evaluating them with. Um, they'll take a look at those and essentially submit a portfolio assessment on what they think they've already demonstrated mastery on. So they'll take a look at their workforce experience, courses that they've taken, um, independent study that they've done, and try to fit that in to those 57 competencies that you saw earlier. They'll submit that to us, and we'll have a team review that evidence um, and then schedule an interview with the student. In that interview, we'll, take a look, we'll use that, the uh, information that we gathered from their portfolio and probe deeper and try to figure out, you know, does, what the student, does the student experience rise to the level of mastery? Um, and then after that, we'll give them a learning profile saying, you know, here are the competencies that you've demonstrated mastery in. Here are the ones that you tried and you have some experience in, but it didn't quite rise to the level of mastery. And then here are the ones that you really need to go through the module for. Um, so after the, as I said, after the diagnostic interview, they'll enroll in a six-month term. Um, and in that term, they'll have access to all of the competency modules. They'll be able to go and do as many of them as they want. Um, They'll be, uh, since the, all of the materials that we're using in the modules are openly licensed, um, they'll be encouraged to, to annotate and to suggest modifications to the modules so that we can continue to improve and make them better and more student focused. 
Um, and it also gives students a little bit of ownership over their curriculum if they've had a role in, in changing it and trying to make it better. Um, at any point after the registration, as I said, they'll be able to move forward right to that summative assessment and take that assessment. So if they went through the interview process and we didn't give them credit, and they're like, well, you know, I really do think that I can do this, they'll have the opportunity to do that and to, to, to prove it to us. And then finally, the, uh, they'll be supported by a new uh, faculty model. Traditionally in our courses, we have uh, what we call mentors because all the students at, at Thomas Edison are, are self-directed adult learners. Um, so they're, they're more facilitators, they're mentors, they're there with the student. Um, in this model, we'll have coaching mentors and we'll have grading mentors. Um, the coaching mentors will be assigned to an individual student and they'll be with that student for their entire academic career. The grading mentors uh, will be assigned to individual competencies based on their expertise and they'll be able to provide substantive feedback for students upon submission. Um, and then finally, uh, students will be given a extended transcript. Um, we're looking at the work uh, that UMUC is doing, that Stanford's doing, that ACRO is doing, um, and we're in the early stages of designing something that, that is our own. So students will have this competency-based transcript um, where they'll be able to show employers exact, exactly what they did to satisfy the competencies. Um, as each one of these uh, links here will go directly to the, the product that the student did to, to satisfy mastery. So that's, that's our model, um, and I'm excited to talk more about it. Great, thanks Steve. Marielle? Great. So I'm not gonna use slides. I'm gonna try to tell my story of how I ended up on this panel. And so my background is that I have a PhD in biology, and I was, um, after getting my PhD, went into teaching, and I ended up coming back to MIT to work on online courses when the announcements of MOOCs happened. And so I worked on the first Introduction to Biology course with the Department of Biology and Eric Lander. And with that, um, we learned there's a big learning curve to the space, so we wanted to, um, so I talked to the department and they created a position for me for overseeing all the online projects, all the future MOOC projects for the Department of Biology. So that's what I do now, but it also entails working on projects for the residential courses with the MIT students, and we create digital learning materials for them to help improve their experience on campus. And sometimes, and for all our MOOC material, we do use it on campus, but we also have some of the materials first created for the residential experience that then end up going out to the public through MOOCs. Um, so I work with two postdocs that are full-time and then some grad students and undergrads help out from time to time. The unique uh, thing about our model is that we are domain experts and subject experts, but we also try to be the expert in technology, the expert in digital um, learning, and the expert in the learning sciences. We do things, in, I mean, my job entails a lot of project management, but we also do things in video. Uh, my, the one postdoc I had animated the videos ourselves, so we did a lot, of, uh, we did most of the course creation all within our own group. Um, so it's different than the central models that most universities use, where there's individuals doing each part of a course. And so we had that first introduction to biology course in March 2013, it was released. And we ran it a few times, uh, instructor paced with deadlines, and we had a lot of activity. And certificates through the edX platform were free at first, and then they were free and for a fee. And then towards the end of 2015, they became for fee only. And it was around that time we wanted to do something to sort of refresh the course anyway. So um, if we were gonna have a for fee certificate, we wanted to help make that certificate more valuable and meaningful to the learners. So with that, we had several motivations for trying to improve the certification of the course. Um, one is that we wanted to just have the learning be more flexible for the learners so that it would be open, uh, the course would be open, all the materials, the problem sets, exams, um, for self-paced learning and for free. So anyone can go in and use the materials at any point, but also um, we wanted to have the uh, experience be fitting the best for the learning sciences so that students had access to uh, instant feedback. And then for the certification side, we wanted to create something that would be more rigorous certification and in hopes that employers or academic programs would recognize this uh, certificate 
as being uh, rigorous and being something meaningful that they would uh, understand that the learner has gone through something that means something that they really have mastered the content for introduction in biology material at MIT. And what we have now is that the course is open, self-paced for any time. The certification is a competency exam. And that competency exam is offered a few times a year in a one week window and it's timed. And we also, our motivations were to have the uh, best coverage of the learning objectives for the course. So we have about 200 learning objectives. So it's very uh, finite, but we try to cover that when, when we design the exam to be the best coverage. And then we also wanted the Bloom's taxonomy level of what we were assessing to match pretty well. So we first evaluated an on-campus semester worth of material um, and what Bloom's level those were falling in. Then we also evaluated the current course materials. And then we created the exam to match the on-campus experience as best as possible. And we um, wanted the problems with this final competency exam for an exam to be separate from the learning experience, we could actually test biology in a more realistic way. Instead of testing just biochemistry, just genetics, we could put it all together like real biology problems happen in the lab, that you put together all different aspects of biology when you're solving something. It wasn't, well, this unit was on biochemistry, so the test has to be biochemistry. Um, then we had, um, one other driving feature, just having a separate competency exam, is the fact that it's pretty easy to cheat with uh, online systems. So we wanted <clears throat> to build something that would be better for the integrity of the honest students and try to keep things fair to them. So we uh, you know, don't show any correctness, we don't show any feedback on the competency exam, and the platform is not enabling us to do that, so we had to hack the system to do that <laughs> at that time. Um, and we also um, have randomization of each problem represents a, a story problem that's randomized, a randomized version of that problem. So with all of that, that's how I ended up here in this space, but it's a small scale relative to a program scale type of thing. <laughs> Great. Um, so obviously folks are coming at this from some different places. Um, and I wonder if we could start a little bit on defining what competency-based education really is. You know, I, I feel like um, to get to the idea that this is a bit of a fad, um, you know, I think it's a real one. Um, some of the programs we hear sound a little bit to me like they're just measuring learning outcomes, which their accreditor probably was requiring them to do anyhow. Um, you know, so that's kind of the CBE light side of things. Mm -hmm. And then on the, on the more aggressive side, you have direct assessment where, do folks, are folks familiar with direct assessment, what, what that is? I think most of you are well. This basically means if you know it and you can do it, you can test out of it and move on. There's completely untethered from the credit hour, completely untethered from time, and frankly freaks out a lot of people in traditional higher education and, and regulators as well. Um, so, but in that range, it seems to me no grades, you know, real mastery, that, that seems to me to be kind of core of the definition of something different, different and emerging. Um, and, and I wonder in that, if you agree with that, and also when we talk about competency-based education, it's often you know, these adult students who can really cruise through things they've already learned, already know how to do. What happens if you can't get past a competency? You know, I think that that side of it, I mean, this is not a gentleman C world <laughs> that you're talking about here. I mean, you have to prove mastery. So, so what happens in that scenario, and, and what do you think about my kind of definition of what, what really is competency-based education? Who wants to take a first crack at that? I, I can start. Um, so as I mentioned, Thomas Edison used to be competency-based education. Um, and even now, we have a degree program um, that Jeff mentioned yesterday where sailor students can go through their courses and come to us um, for the challenge exam all the way up to a degree. And some folks might consider that to be competency-based yeah. because it's self-paced. Mm -hmm. Um, there are no grades because it's prior learning assessment. Um, but for us, what we're really trying to do is build that direct assessment modality because we think it adds additional value for the student um, in terms of being able to advance kind of at their own pace, even if they only uh, know a small piece of it. They're able to be credentialed in that small piece. Um, it also allows them to have more transparency about what they know because we're building this content and these assessments around discrete skills and abilities rather than saying, 
you know, you got credit in English comp. Right, right. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, I think the US Department of Education, they have a definition of comp C base being that it's flexibility, transitioning away from seat time into flexibility for the learners. And that matches well, and they even recommend online or blended programs that matches well with what, our do what we're doing. And then I think really focusing on matching the assessments with what your objectives are with the content. But also, um, we do allow for our competency exam that you don't have to do anything in the course. That if you just know it from work experience or if you know it from uh, taking a course in another school is fine if you just take the exam and most of the learners that we're seeing who are taking the exam they want to use it for a job application an application to another program or to show a professional development within their own workplace so they can do it just at any point if they feel they're ready to do it sure. Sure. so I mean I think I spoke at some length about my, my view of this thing the only thing that um, you asked like a really important question Paul which is you know, yeah, it's great if, great if you can motor through, but what if you need more time? And it seems to me the key is the flexibility of the time, not accelerated, right? Because one of the cruelties, it seems to me, of the, our system is that, you know, whether your semester is, you know, 15 weeks or eight weeks, there's sort of this presumption that everybody starts at the same place and, you know, in lockstep, you know, <laughs> sort of marches through to the bitter end and then, you know, it's a little bit like, um, you know, um, musical chairs, you know, that sort of, well, you didn't get it too bad, you know, you could have gone faster too bad, you know. So, because for College for America, there are no grades, but there's also no, it's really self, uh, not self-paced, it's flexibly paced, so that if it takes you a whole bunch of times to master something, it does. Um, and the whole idea is that the curriculum really supports the demonstration of, of competencies, not the other way around, right? So we often think of assessment as this thing that comes after the curriculum and says, oh, how much of this do they know? And I think if you turn it around and say you start with what those competencies are and then think about um, you know, how can you support students in developing them, it looks very different. Sure. And just to add to that, um, I think one of the unique things about competency-based education is the, the coaching model that goes along yeah. with it and the fact that you do have someone who's with the student throughout their entire academic career, understands their goals, understands their limitations, and can give them escalating feedback if they fail. So in a traditional course, if you fail the final exam, you fail the course. In our, at least in our competency-based education program, you have up to three attempts. And so if you fail the first one, we'll give you additional support. If you fail the second one, will still give you even more support. Um, so I think that's an important component of that as well. Great. So some of you talked about the, the challenge of transcripting uh, competencies. I mean, it seems to me, we, we hear a lot about exciting innovations in higher ed, um, but it seems that the HR department is where some of those ideas go to die, um, where you know, <laughs> folks you know, in HR just look for kind of familiar alma maters and programs. And um, what are some of the, the elements of your programs that you really think are of value to employers? And how do you convey them in a way that, that sticks? Anyone want to take a crack at that? Mary? I mean, in, in my case, it's not a program. It's getting people to see the value of an individual certificate. And in that case, it's really getting the word out there that our model of how we're doing the cert certification is different. And the other part is, you know, we are in Kendall Square and we're near very, you know, the, we're in the biotech central area. So we can just, you know, try to reach out to the people and the connections we have there to really explain to them how it's different and why it's different. And, you know, if you want to know if your lab tech has this background or not and what level of biology they know, they can take this exam. And we also work with local programs for high school teachers and they uh, use our materials because um, that's another group of people getting training because biology has changed a lot over time. So knowing biology 20 years ago is very different from knowing biology now. So a lot of people need updating and biology knowledge and going through the course or you know just taking the exam to show that you have that updated knowledge is valuable to some people. Anyone else? So College for America is a little bit unusual in that everyone who comes in comes in through an employer. Um, so, but I can tell you that employers are actually thrilled about 
um, competency-based education because they, that's the language they speak by and large. <clears throat> but um, it's actually not so much the HR department, it's sometimes the, the form that the HR department requires to have something reimbursed, right? And I remember we were at a very large um, logistics and shipping company that I won't mention somewhere in the South, <laughs> and um, we had this conversation in which the high-level people were really excited, and somebody says, but I don't understand. It says gr the grade has to be at least a C, and where will we put this in the form? And there went, you know. <laughs> um, now, we, we actually worked a lot with employers, and there are definitely workarounds, but I find it's not necessarily the core learning model. It's, you know, getting people reimbursed if their employer is paying for it, or financial aid and that kind of thing. That sure. actually is where a lot of it goes to die. Sure. So. Yeah, I mean, I think the key is just to make sure that employers are, are part of the process. Right. That you know they've taken a look at your competencies, that they value your competencies, and that those relationships are set up ahead of time, so that by the time you have a student go through, they know what they can do with it already. So, it, a lot of interest in competency-based ed, but you know I, I have heard that some of the programs aren't as big as people had hoped they would be. Um, you know, WGU has something like eighty thousand students, and the College for America, Capella, some others have really big, robust programs. In, in the several thousands of students. Um, but some of the other ones are really boutique -y and small. And I wonder what, if, if part of that is kind of you know, explaining what this is to people. You know, I, I write about this all the time, and going under 1,500 words is really hard to do. <laughs> it's, it's really complicated. So, so what are some of the barriers to scaling this up, to getting to really being a, a meaningful part of the American higher education landscape? Anyone want to? Take a crack at that, Mary Ellen. Um, yeah, so even at MIT, I gave a talk in May to our own people in digital learning, and I had to start with the definition of competency-based because it's not really discussed much um, using that term on our campus or around our campus, and even within the digital learning space, um, it's not discussed that much. And so, um, you know, one of the few examples with this course and what we're doing. Um, of going that direction, and so it is a lot of education, and even within our own institutes in that case. Sure. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the marketing materials for CBE programs, they don't say competency-based education. It's right. flex path. It's flex a flexible option. It's yeah. you know, there's there's always flexibilities in there, but we're not coming out and telling students like, oh, this is competency-based education. You know, we all care about what it is because we're educators, but I don't think it's made that jump into the mainstream. Should we though? I mean, what do you think? Should is it important that people think of it as competency-based education? I think it's important from the standpoint of getting uh, accreditors, regulators, lawmakers, and ed tech companies on board with it. As long as we're all speaking the same language, we can work towards the same definitions, the same standards, the same yeah. systems. The University of Wisconsin system has a high-profile uh, direct assessment uh, competency-based program. I think it's pretty small, though. I think 1,200, 1,500 students right now. Um, but they have an a online little ad for it, and I think it's called FlexPath. Mm -hmm. um, I, it does a great job of explaining this in 30 seconds. I, I, I really, I, it's worth checking out, actually. Um, so let's briefly, before we open up to questions, talk about the regulatory side. Um, believe it or not, we're in Washington. This is an issue that is actually bipartisan. There, there's a bipartisan bill to, to create a demonstration project around competency-based ed. It seems that... The past administration really liked competency-based ed. It seems like this one is, is not going to at least stop it on um, the interest and maybe, <laughs> maybe encourage it once they kind of staff up. Um, but what, what would you like to see Washington do and accreditors do to, to both preserve quality, pr protect it, but to also encourage this, the growth in this field? Any, anyone? Any, any, I know this is not a simple question. but Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll start with this one. Um, I think you know, the question has always been, what do we as taxpayers want to pay for? And, and up until now, it's been instruction. Um, and I think with competency-based education, it starts a conversation around, it, should, we, should we be paying for instruction or should we be paying for outcomes? Should we be paying for what a student knows and can do? Um, so when you, you change the paradigm to, to focus on that, things like regular and substantive interaction don't seem as important because the reason why that exists is to make sure that students are getting instruction. Can, can you briefly explain that? <laughs> briefly? Yeah, it's not easy. Um, so regular and substantive interaction is a, a statute that um, differentiates uh, distance learning uh, from correspondence education uh, and has to do with whether or not the faculty member is regularly interacting with the student. 
um, and it has to be faculty uh, instigated. And just briefly on that, so the, the Office of Inspector General at the U.S. Department of Education has been auditing Western Governors University, which is obviously the big fish here, um, on the regular and substantive issue. And if they find that they're not operating under the statutes, they might label it as a correspondence course provider, which would be very bad and for, for, <laughs> for WGU, okay, yeah. and would, have, would require them actually to pay back some of the federal aid they've received over the years. So this is a very hot, delicate issue right now. And a lot of folks are wondering where the kind of regulatory side will go. You know, it's it's hard because I'm I'm torn. Honestly, I you know I'm really interested in new models. I think there are serious issues with the current ones, and I'm aware that there's this rush to the bottom whenever there's a loophole. And so I do believe that the amount of money at stake is so huge that you do have to deal with fraud and abuse. You have to try to prevent it. At the same time, whenever I hear somebody say, "Well, I don't know," you know, direct assessment that sounds pretty fishy, and I think. Oh, when indirect assessment is okay with you? Like, you know, <laughs> that we never question the status quo, and I think with the level of scrutiny that it deserves to be. And, and we actually had a fabulous experience with our, um, a little shout out to NIASC, a great, great experience. But, you know, it's a, it's a sort of different, you know, that hasn't been the case in every regional. And um, there is, again, such a disconnect between, you know, the, the folks in the, you know, undersecretary's office and, you know, the folks who actually are seeing, you know, um, does this, you know, you know, fit the regulations or the folks from the IG's office that, you know, you can have a very positive movement that is stopped in its tracks by people who are really essentially, you know, small-minded, if you don't mind my saying so. So, you know, I, I just think we have to go back, as you said, to what is the purpose of higher education, what's the purpose of, you know, the societal interest in it and support for it, and what are we as taxpayers you know, willing to um, demand, right? And it's not, you know, the some of the things that we that are happening now. So. Well, it is. It, you raise a good point about the double standard that it's just there, and yeah. you know, th there's not a lot of interest in regular and substantive contact in 600-person lecture halls. But exactly, yeah. it just is what it is. So I think we'd like to try questions here. Anyone want to give us one? I, I think we have one over here. Got a microphone right coming right there. This is Steve Brandt from Bay Path University. The point about do versus no, with your, mm -hmm. your point in the beginning. So in the business world, do is either visual or proximity. It's hard to see do when it's virtual, right? So if, you know, when confronted with this situation, this is a particular way that we hope that you would behave in terms of assessing some kind of behavior. And the question is, how do you do so, how do you create competencies that cannot be assessed it's hard to assess them virtually or in words or how, where does that go yeah. in terms of if it's done like in business it's you know in many businesses it's like face to face like if you're trying to teach people customer service for example it's about how they interact with the people who are in front of them not necessarily I do corporate learning so that's sort of what I'm thinking about yeah no actually it's it's a, a interesting question because it gives me the opportunity to clarify what I mean by do and what I mean by do could involve right it could involve um, you know, speak, sing, take blood, you know, um, uh, write a reflective, I mean, there are any number of things. So what I mean by do, though, is that there is, um, in the Department of Labor's definition of competency, that you are um, using, you know, basically knowledge, skills, and abilities to perform a task, right? So there's an implied quality to it that nonetheless may have a lot of knowledge behind it. So in your answer to, you know, how can you do that virtually, first of all, College for America was, is exclusively online. We had videos, we had audios. We, I mean, you know, we now live in a pretty, pretty virtual world in many cases, and all of my work virtually is, is virtual, and people have very strong feelings, I think, about whether I'm doing it or not doing it or doing it well. So I think if you focus on the sort of product, in a sense, whether the product is um, an interview which you can tape and evaluate, um, you know, rather than on the imparting of knowledge, right, the teaching, um, I think to go back to your point, I think it certain things open up a lot, and you know so. When you have, you know, a um, flight attendant, a crew member who's, you know, if you want to teach, them, if a skill that they want or some behavior is, you know, exert some level of emotional intelligence when interacting with a incivil or someone who's not civil, sitting in the seat, and everybody's got their cell phones out. 
If that's something you want to teach, because that's what the corporate experience needs to do, how do you do that when, I guess oh, there's well, ways. I mean, we did that sort of thing all the time, right? And so part of what you need to do, though, if, if it's in both a teaching, or I would prefer to say learning as well as an assessment experience, is that you have to be very clear about what are the characteristics of uh, behavior that you're looking for, or the doing that you're looking for. So, um, I mean, this is something the Army has done for years, right? I mean, it's, it's when we think, it's really in the academic world, we tend to think a little bit, because the paradigm of teacher, student, face-to-face -face is so powerful that we forget there's so much to learn from, um, you know, how you train um, psychologists, how you train, I mean, you, you, you could watch, you know, a zillion tapes of people, you can model it, and the wonderful thing is when you throw in digital technology, you have all sorts of opportunities to watch it over and over again, to, um, you know, to respond in certain ways, to aspects of it, to slow it down, to blow it up, you know, and so I, I think that there's a very robust set of opportunities here. I can add to that. In biology, we actually are adding more realistic experiences with online than what they are doing on campus with just a PDF of something or a paper exam. Because in biology now, um, and when we created the first course, the first MOOC, we were trying to think, well, what can we do in the online space that we couldn't do in the one hour paper exam? And we uh, designed problem sets or exams where they can look at actual gene sequences and we you know had the right connections the right software around that we may have modified it some to be student friendly but they are looking at real genes the stories are about you know mutations within genes that are associated with real diseases we tried to create the uh, problems to be a realistic biological experience um, they also look at proteins they move the structures around in 3d space you can't do that on a paper exam and all of that is similar to what the research scientists use in the lab. And so we can do more in online. And there's also ways to test that with computer grading that it's hard for me and that's part of my job. But we have to know what can the platform do and what are we trying to test. And then we need people like me to translate that to like how do we test it in online. And um, there are tools where we can have students create data um, we give a scenario, explain what's happening, and say, okay, produce the data. They're not going to the lab to produce the data, but we can computer grade them producing the data from an experiment. Other questions out there? I guess you want in the middle. Not fully a question, but kind of a, a follow-up to that is, as I think there's a misnomer that all competency-based education has to be 100% digital and online. It, it doesn't. Um, you, you know, we uh, one of the programs that we're taking at our college and moving to a uh, competency-based approach is welding. Mm -hmm. Most of the didactic piece can be done in an online environment, but we set up open lab spaces for people to come in and do virtual welding and then actually demonstrating the skills because they need AWS certification and they have to actually lay the welding uh, beads to make sure that that is a certified weld and so forth. So you can take a competency-based approach and if your program absolutely needs a face-to-face -face or a scenario-based um, situation like in law enforcement training where you're actually going to have to have them apply these skills in a, a mock scenario of a domestic or whatever, um, you can have competency-based taking approach where you're still removing the time, you're still giving flexibility, um, not Carnegie credit hours or anything like that, but I, I just think that so many people think competency-based means you absolutely have to have 100% online, and that isn't the case. Yeah, just to take the moderator's privilege here uh, and tell you about one, one program I wrote about, Lipscomb uh, University in Tennessee's, I believe, 100% face-to-face competency-based program, and I actually watched their intake of new students behind a one-way mirror where they have them all day long do business scenarios to really set a baseline for where they are in their learning. And it was intimidating, um, by the way. <laughs> really <laughs> intense experience. Anyone else want to talk about the kind of face? I was actually going to bring up Lipscomb. So. <laughs> okay, well, we covered that. All right, just a couple more minutes here. Any, any more questions out there? I see one over here. Oh, thank you. Hi, my name is Michelle Mills. I'm from the US Department of Labor, um, Office of Apprenticeships. I uh, just started, though, just a couple of days ago. Um, and I'm curious, we mentioned regulatory frameworks. 
So I'm curious, uh, the top two legislative reforms that would possibly help advance um, this initiative and movement. And second, the second question, um, uh, how could we partner more effectively to promote apprenticeship opportunities? And how is that evaluated in terms of curriculums, assessment, accreditation, et cetera? Thank you. Well, for me, um, two regulations that I'd like to see change or go away. Um, regular and substantive, for sure. Um, that, that needs to be changed, especially if the focus is, again, more around outcomes. Um, and the second one is, uh, with the experimental sites, there are certain financial aid waivers, um, for instance, allowing a subscription-based model rather than a term-based model that I think just adds another element uh, that we can all experiment with and play around with and add more value for the students. Um, and to your point about apprenticeships, at Thomas Edison, we have uh, a department that goes out and reviews uh, academic tra academic uh, training programs, certifications, trainings, apprenticeships, uh, similar to ACE and NCCRS who we heard about earlier, um, and assesses them for credit. Certainly, uh, something like that could be done in a competency-based format as well. So, at least in our case, um, the intake process, you know, if you're coming to us with a certain apprenticeship, we would already know how that would speak to your requirements um, to the degree. Just briefly, on, on the apprenticeship side, the President's executive order on apprenticeship, I think it was last week I wrote about that, kind of opens the door, I think, to a competency-based approach in the learning component in that it, it allows, uh, so to, to be federally registered as an apprenticeship, you have to go through an application process. That is, I know you know this, but the, the, <laughs> under the order, companies and, and education providers can kind of come up with their own definitions of what a registered apprenticeship would be, and, and the word competency gets batted around a lot in that. Um, but anyone else want to? Um, well, I just want to say, which is, um, first of all, I went like this when you said Department of Labor, because I worked there um, back in prehistory, and uh, <laughs> one of the things that was happening then is that the Department of Labor and the Department of Education were talking to each other all the time and really working jointly on sort of school to work and what were then called skill standards and so on, and I, at least, um, in the previous administration, I think that really, I mean, we all knew all about, you know, uh, the Department of Education, and I think many people were less aware of what the Department of Labor was doing. So I think that that's a very productive, you know, not making this sort of split between, you know, work, education, you know, I think would be very productive. And I know you'll see to that personally because you, you know, have connections there now. So, right. Yeah, I just have general um, thoughts on policy, just the idea of supporting a workforce that will have a lifelong learning model because mm. that's required now, especially in science, it's changing year to year. So by the time you get a four-year degree, everything's being taught in those courses is outdated unless the faculty are updating the courses each year. So the degree doesn't matter as much, but the on-demand, getting uh, knowledge, you know, if it is that, you know, a school put out a new course that is updated information, allowing the learners to go use that and get it, you know, the moment they need it, rather than the idea of, you know, having to have the degree only, that these uh, on-demand learning experiences matter and getting recognition for that. Well, with that, we're out of time. I hope you join with me in, in giving a hand of applause to our excellent panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.